well, do you, did you have many trick-or-treaters last night? <laughs> Expecting some tonight? Do you have the candy ready? What's your costume this year, huh? I understand the most popular costumes will continue to be witches and then dinosaurs and cowboys and fairies and Spider-Man and Cruella de Vil is big this year. But for some of us, October 31st has a totally different meaning than what everybody else is thinking about today. And I want to speak to what I'll call the real meaning of today, which has nothing to do with Halloween. Uh, as Americans, certain dates stand out to us, don't they? When I say uh, July 4th, 1776, December 7th, 1941, November 22nd, 1963, September 11th, 2001. Well, October 31st, 1517 is a date that I think every Christian should know, particularly Protestant Christians. And here's why. Here's why. In the 16th century, 500 years ago, if you went to church, you were Roman Catholic, with the exception of very few places in the world where the Eastern Orthodox Church was the dominant church. You were, that was the only church there was, Roman Catholic Church. And there was a lot of frustration building in the church at that time. There were problems and corruption in the leadership. Priests were known to get drunk and have concubines. Uh, teachers and preachers were way too academic. They were speaking over people's heads. Bishops and cardinals enjoyed great wealth and great power. And they didn't really serve the people. And people saw the church as becoming just more and more irrelevant. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church has as its leader a pope. Now, 500 years ago, uh, the pope spent more time collecting art and building beautiful cathedrals and living in luxury than nurturing the spiritual life of the church. The word reform means change. When you reform, you change. And the people wanted to change. They were ready for reform. Now, into this social and religious climate came a man named Martin Luther. Luther was from Germany, and he had received a, a great education. He studied to be a lawyer, but through a various circumstances became a priest and then a Catholic monk. And throughout his life, Luther was plagued with this sense of his unworthiness before God. He felt like he could never please God, no matter what he did. Luther kept a list of his sins, and he confessed them again and again. He practiced severe spiritual discipline and punished himself in hope that, um, that, that he would feel better. And, and his conscience just kept making him feel guilty. His conscience just kept saying, well, you fell short there. Oh, you didn't put that sin on your list of sins that you're keeping. Oh, you're not sorry enough. And everything he tried just made his torment worse. And he even grew to think of God as cruel and unjust and unable to be satisfied. Martin Luther just felt everybody, God loved everybody else but him. He earned a degree in theology, and he got a position in the city of Wittenberg at the university, teaching the Bible at that university. And as he read and he studied Paul's letter to the Romans, the book of Romans in the New Testament, Luther began to have a life-transforming, really a world-transforming experience. God's word began to speak to him like never before. And it was Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, that really caught his attention. In these verses that we read, Paul says that the gospel is the power of God to save anyone and everyone who believes. Doesn't matter who you are. The gospel is the plan of God's rescue. 
in the message of the gospel, God reveals his way of making us, who are sinful, rebellious human beings, right with him. The gospel has the power to save us. Now, salvation has two sides to it. We are saved from God's judgment, but we're also saved to a right relationship with him and to eternal life. We're saved from something and we're saved to something. And Paul writes in Romans that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. What does that mean? Well, righteousness means to be right with God. It means to be accepted by God, to have peace with God. And this being right with God, it says in Romans 1, is by faith from first to last. Or some Bibles say, from faith to faith. We become right with God when we have faith. And there are three components to faith. Three components to faith. We have faith when we trust. The first component is trust. Trust is a relational term. You don't trust something, you trust someone. And in the New Testament, that someone is Jesus Christ. Second, faith involves belief. Belief that what God has done in Jesus Christ is true and will be true, whether anybody responds to it or not. And then the third component of faith is commitment. We commit ourselves to God, whether it's easy or whether it's hard. It's a decision that we make that each one of us has to make. Jesus Christ is the content of the gospel message. And anyone who responds to him with faith, with trust, with belief, with commitment, that what he has done makes us right with God and saves us, that sets anyone right with God. Anyone. It isn't how much good we do. It isn't about being good enough or earning enough points with God that he saves us. It is simply having faith that Christ and his life and death and resurrection is the only thing that's going to make us righteous before God. Luther thought that phrase at the very end of verse 17, that the righteous will live by faith, means that only righteous people can live by faith. He believed that he was not righteous and therefore he couldn't have faith and therefore he couldn't be saved by God. He said, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. And then one day he saw something he'd never seen before. He realized that that phrase, the righteousness of God, meant the gift that God gives to sinners that he lavishly gives and freely gives to sinners. And he came to realize that the righteous live by faith. What that means is that it's what God has done for us that what makes people right with God. Faith is not something we do so that God will accept us, but faith is trust that God accepts us in Christ. The gospel is that God has done what needs to be done, and he acted first. What we do is just a response to his love and to his grace. There's nothing to earn. There's no work you can do. There's no spiritual ladder you can climb. There is no living that is good enough to save ourselves before God. Salvation is a gift. All we can do is receive that gift and say, I accept it in faith. The idea that we were right with God simply by faith was way different than what people were hearing in the churches in that day. There was a great deal of spiritual fear in Luther's day in the Roman Catholic Church. And that church played upon it. At that time, they played upon it for their own purposes. One of the ways they did it is through something that was called the system of indulgences. Uh, an indulgence was a sum of money that you would pay to the priest or to the church to assure that you were forgiven. At simplest, an indulgence, the selling of indulgences was the selling of forgiveness. And the Catholic Church at that time was teaching, a belief found nowhere in the Bible, that after death, people went to a place called purgatory where you would work off your sins before you could go to heaven. And priests taught that if you paid certain amounts of money, bought indulgences, 
You could earn credit against your own sins, therefore making your time in purgatory shorter, and you could even get your loved ones out of purgatory right now. And one of the most effective salesmen of indulgences and relics was a guy named Johann Tetzel. He was so good at this that the Pope hired him full time to just do this. Tetzel went around to the crowd speaking and asking them to imagine the voices of their dead relatives calling out from purgatory to have pity on them, asking them to pay the money to get them out of the torment in which they're currently suffering. And he, he would preach that as soon as people put their coins in the coffer, the souls of their loved ones would be freed from their suffering that they were experiencing. And people bought up indulgences like we were buying up toilet paper at the beginning of the pandemic. They did this to have their sins and the sins of their loved ones forgiven. They didn't know any better. And the money was used by priests for all kinds of luxuries on themselves. It was a racket that was going on. And this type of corruption began to really make Martin Luther burn. Remember, he was a priest within the church, and he was also a teacher of the scriptures. And having come to realize that scripture said that the forgiveness of sins and right relationship with God comes by faith, Luther knew that the Pope and the archbishops and the cardinals and the priests, were what they were giving the people was wrong. And on October 31st, 1570, Martin Luther took a list of 95 statements, or theses as they were called, and he nailed them to the door of the church in Wittenberg, where everybody would go in and out. And it was 95 theses, statements he wrote against this system of indulgences. It was a call for debate. He was calling out the church authorities. Luther was convinced that the Bible taught we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing else. This is what he said. He said, we don't depend on our own strength. We don't depend on our own conscience, our own experience, person, or works. But we depend on what's outside of ourselves. That is, on the promise and the truth of God, which cannot deceive us. The 95 Theses that were statements challenging what the Roman Catholic Church was doing. And Luther wrote them because he was so convinced that it's only by God's grace that we're saved. Luther engaged in several public debates with the authorities and the church about this over the next several years. He publicly, he loudly challenged the authorities solely on the Bible. Now understand, Luther wasn't the first one to ever raise these questions. Others had too. Here's the difference. All the others had been killed. It didn't go over real well. Well, eventually they threw Luther out of the church. No longer a priest, no longer part of the church. And in 1521, the Holy Roman Emperor summoned Luther one final time, and he gave Luther one final chance to take back everything he had ever said, his teaching, his preaching, his writing. Luther stood before these authorities, and this is what he said. Unless I'm convinced by the testimony of Scripture, or by clear reason, for I don't trust the Pope or the councils alone, since it's well known they've erred, they've contradicted themselves. Luther said, I'm bound by scriptures that I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything, for it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand, I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. And people all over Europe were taken by Luther's teaching. They were tired of the corruption of the church. They were tired of the spiritual wasteland it had become. And people were hungry for the word of God and the promises of God's grace. Because Luther exposed the air, the wrong thinking that human beings had the ability to get themselves to God or even get near enough to God to accept them. 
he realized it's not a matter of God being far from us and us having to strive to reach him. He said the reverse was true. People are distant from God, but God came in Christ to meet us. It wasn't really new. It was just a reclaiming of the gospel of grace that had always been in the scriptures. And when Luther nailed those 95 theses to that door, it began what we call the Protestant Reformation. It began, uh, and it was fueled by the Word of God, it began the Protestant church movement. Protestant, it was called Protestant because they were called the protesters. Protestant. Protest. Some people left the Catholic Church and joined new Protestant churches that began to spring up all over Europe. At that time, there was also a new piece of technology, way before the iPhone. It was called the printing press. It had just come out. Now, Bibles, which had previously had to be copied by hand, they could be copied in mass. And beforehand, only churches or priests had a copy of a Bible. Now, common people could get their hands on parts of the Bible and read it for themselves. Up to that time, the Bible had only been published in Latin. Luther went through the whole thing and put it in the common language of the people, in German, where he lived, so that everybody could read it, everybody could hear it, everybody could understand it in their own tongue. And he printed that Bible on printing presses, as many copies as he could. And people read it, and they heard the preaching of the Reformers, and they came to understand themselves with God in a new way. They understood that being right with God comes by faith. Hence, this is who we are today. The Presbyterian Church is a branch of the Protestant Church. We read scripture from what is called a reformed perspective because we come from that reformation. Uh, we hold to the ref reformed scriptural conviction that faith makes us right with God and it comes through the mighty work of Christ and his death and resurrection. We still haven't gotten over October 31st, 1517 when Luther first nailed those 95 statements to the church door. It's part of our tradition. It's part of our history. And the Reformation really opened things up. No longer was the Pope or any human authority, uh, or any human the authority. Now Scripture was the authority. Forgiveness wasn't something you had to pay for or earn, but something that came free by the grace of God. No longer were priests the only ones who could serve and minister. For the Reformation reclaimed the New Testament teaching that all people are priests before God. People could have a direct relationship now with God that was unmediated by any other person. Now people heard messages directly from the Bible as the Reformers began to preach the Scriptures verse by verse, phrase by phrase. October 31st celebrates the Protestant Reformation. And let me end by saying three significant things I highlight that came out of this. Number one, the emphasis on the Word of God. Martin Luther and the Reformation reclaimed the power of the Word of God. One of the mottos was... Whoa, a Latin phrase, sola scriptura, which meant scripture alone. They said, that's what we go on now, scripture alone. And there's a reason over the centuries that people have gone to such pains to translate and write and preserve what we have in the Old and New Testaments. There's a reason it's read and preached in churches all over the world. Paul writes in 2 Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the person of God, that's you and me, may be complete and equipped for every good word, work. The Reformers believed the Bible is how God speaks to humanity. There's no growth in life with God without the Scriptures. And the more we dig into it, the more we grow. Nothing beats time spent in God's Word when it comes to spiritual growth. The nutrients for the Christian life are in the Bible. And it is to be read and studied and meditated upon and taught and preached and memorized and heard. 
And I suspect that the spiritual shallowness and lack of faith that characterizes our day is a result of biblical illiteracy and just little interaction with God's Word. We cut off the main way that God wants to speak to us and then we wonder why we feel so far from Him or we don't have any strength in our faith. You show me a person who regularly takes time to reflect on the Bible and I will show you someone whose life reflects Jesus. There's hardly a day that goes by that I don't myself get into the Word of God and not just because I'm a pastor but because I want to follow Jesus. Second thing that came out of the Reformation, the power of the Gospel. The power of the Gospel. If you've ever felt you can't cut it with God, or that you aren't religious enough, or that you aren't spiritual enough, or if you've ever wondered if you can ever be good enough, there is good news. God has done what we could never do. Our sin creates astronomical distance between us and God, but He has forgiven us and brought us to Himself. I know our modern times explains everything away with psychological, sociological, or genetic factors. And we say, oh, we're just too sophisticated to believe in sin. Yet our lives are filled with more alienation and pain and brokenness than ever before. We say, you know, it's just too pessimistic to think about sin. What we really need is to feel better about ourselves. You know, the good news of the gospel of Christ is the freedom that comes when we're honest. The power of the message is that it doesn't make excuses or rationalizations, but in honesty it says, you know what, I'm wrong before God, but I accept by faith the grace that God gives to me to make me right with Him. There's a freedom when you're able to say, I don't have to carry this anymore. God forgives me and helps me. And you say that every day. The power of the gospel is not only the diagnosis of the problem, but it is the cure for the problem. That God has come to us himself in Jesus Christ. Lived the life we should have lived. Died the death that we should have died and given us his righteousness. Romans 1. In the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that's by faith. You may say... But I don't feel right with God. It's not our feelings that determine the reality of that relationship. It is what God has said about us that matters. And he has said that he sees us as forgiven and right and loved by him. A free gift of God to all those who have faith. Last thing. Protestant Reformation brought... October 31st brought the flourishing of Protestant Christianity. The Protestant tradition was set off by Martin Luther leading the Reformation. And it's given us a number of churches. One of those is the Presbyterian Church. Just one of them. Each church within Protestantism took the Reformation in a little different direction. But we all grew out of this. And that's why this date is significant for us. When Luther posted those 95 theses, the church changed. You know, one of the interesting things about Martin Luther is he was a songwriter. Uh, Luther used to, one of his favorite things to do was to take local popular songs, often songs he heard in the pub, and he changed the words to words of faith. Imagine taking... A song from the Rolling Stones or Lady Gaga and putting faith words to them. That's what Luther did. Probably the song you know best by Luther is Away in a Manger. We sing it every Christmas. He wrote that. But the most sung hymn of Luther is a hymn called A Mighty Fortress is Our God. The title comes from the opening of Psalm 46, which the words we used in our call to worship, that God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. The original title of that hymn was A Safe Stronghold, Our God is Still. 
But a mighty fortress is our God kind of became the anthem of the Reformation. There are two words that we're going to sing in this hymn that I want to clarify so that when you get to them, you'll know what we're singing. The first word is bulwark. Bulwark means strong defense or support. The second thing we're going to sing, we'll sing a phrase, Lord Sabaoth. Lord Sabaoth. Sabaoth comes from the Hebrew word for hosts, as in Lord of hosts. And Lord of hosts refers to God as the leader of the angel armies of heaven. As we sing this great song of faith, a mighty fortress is our God, pay attention to the words. They are strong words. And let these words lift our faith and lift our hearts up to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all the examples of faith over the years, particularly this morning for Martin Luther, whose courage and faith put a spotlight on your grace. Thank you for your word that tells us who you are and how we can be in relationship with you. Thank you for the good news that you came into this world in Jesus to save us. Help us to believe this gospel and live by faith. Amen.